to put um, uh, the events of last week into perspective, I, I think it's important that we have a little bit of uh, background first. Um, we know that the treatment of people with CML has completely changed over the last 15 years um, with the advent and um, uh, availability of oral medications that can inhibit the ABLE tyrosine kinase, beginning with imatinib, now known as Gleevec, followed by nilotinib, which is Tisigna, and Tisatinib, which is Spreisel, and then most recently in 2012, the approval of Basutinib or Basula, and finally in December 2012, the accelerated approval of Panatinib or Eclusic. Five ABLE tyrosine kinase inhibitors, these drugs have completely changed the lives of people with CML and extending the lives of people with CML. How does this work? Well, the drug is driven, I'm sorry, the disease is driven by this overactive enzyme called BCR-ABL, BCR-ABL, a product of the Philadelphia chromosome. These drugs turn off that enzyme and not only then lead to uh, normalization of blood counts, shrinkage of the spleen, resolution of a lot of the symptoms related to the disease like fevers and night sweats, but also changes the natural history or natural progression of this disease. This disease is a life-threatening leukemia because it can progress into an acute leukemia that we call blast crisis. These drugs are able to slow, if not even prevent completely, the development of blast crisis in many patients. And that's why the lives of people with CML have, have been extended and have changed since even 15 years ago when these drugs weren't available. However, we know that no drug is perfect. People might have side effects to a drug, and no drug is completely safe. And so side effects may keep people from taking a fully therapeutic dose or any of the drug. On the other hand, we also know that, especially in cancer therapy, that cancers can become resistant to even the best treatments. Cancers can mutate or change and become resistant. And these, these two events, intolerance of the ABLE tyrosine kinase inhibitors and also the development of resistance, have clearly been seen to occur in people with CML who are treated with the currently available ABLE tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And what's been truly dramatic is the rapid development over these last 15 years of second and third generation drugs that have helped people who were on imatinib at the beginning and had become intolerant or had become resistant to the, the, uh, the treatment. One of the mechanisms of resistance is the development of a mutation known as the T315I mutation. One single amino acid in this huge uh, chain of amino acids called bcr able changes and makes the enzyme completely resistant to the, the first four ABLE tyrosine kinase inhibitors that were approved. However, panatinib, or occlusic, is remains active even when the T315I mutation is present. And even if this disease does not develop the T315I mutation, but if patients had been on imatinib and become resistant or second gen and second generation drugs like nilotinib and disatinib and become resistant, about 50% of people will have a response to panatinib. And so when this was approved in December of uh, 2012, um, this was uh, a big advance uh, for uh, people uh, with this disease. And now the results of that large phase two study of panatinib that led to the accelerated approval have been um, uh, published by Jorge Cortez and multiple colleagues around, around uh, the world. Uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine just in this past week, which makes the events of this last week even um, uh, more um, uh, surprising. In December of 2012, based on a careful analysis of the data that was available to the FDA, a black box warning was issued. Black box warning is a warning of a side effect associated with a drug that we need to pay particular attention to. And for panatinib or occlusive, the safety signal that was seen were multiple events that basically involve blockage of arteries to vital organs. And so 
people who have been treated with panatinib on these studies had been known to develop heart attacks, so cardiovascular events, strokes, cerebrovascular occlusive events, and even blockage of blood flow to a limb, arterial occlusive events. And some of these events led to death. Now, we don't really understand to what degree the characteristics of people taking panatinib in these studies may have led to these events. In other words, is it that they had other risk factors for arterial occlusive or blocking, blocking events like diabetes and hypertension? Could it be that we can prevent some of these with prophylactic therapies like aspirin? Um, is it a dose-related event? Would a lower dose of panatinib lead to the same incident? So we still have a lot to learn about this, but clearly there was a safety signal and about seven to eight percent of people were reported to have had these arterial occlusive events. And so as we prescribe this medication to, to our patients with disease, physicians have been talking about the potential benefit of panatinib in their case, but also the potential for harm, as we always do with any drug that we prescribe, especially in, in cancer and leukemias. Well, Last Thursday, October 31st, after a review of more data that was coming out of the uh, initial phase one and phase two study and an ongoing phase three study, the FDA and Ariad jointly decided to withdraw benatinib, occlusive, from commercial availability because of an apparent increase in the incidence or the number of people over time developing these very serious, if not life-threatening, complications associated with panatinib. And so the, the decision was well-founded. Physicians who prescribe this drug are very concerned about the arterial occlusive events that have been associated with it, and we take this into account when we prescribe it. However, we also know that panatinib is a medication that may be the only drug that can control the disease. And so we have this tension now. We have some patients who are on panatinib. They are tolerating panatinib, not having these events, and may not have any other options. I have these patients in my own clinic, and I've been talking with colleagues around the country who have told me about people that they are treating who really have no other option except for panatinib. And that's where our concern lies. Because when this um, uh, uh, notification came out on October 31st, very quick, quickly within 24 hours, a number of leukemia specialists around the country were speaking by email about how to get this medication to our patients who um, need it. The notification that came out from the FDA and Ariad was that there would be a process known as the single patient Investigational New Drug Application, IND application. The concern that many of us have in having filed IND applications in the past in other situations is that it may take some time to get approval for this emergency use of an investigational agent. Some of our patients are on these medications and with these very expensive oral medications they only have a one month supply that come from specialty pharmacies. And so this ruling came at various points in that month of supply for some of our patients. And so there may be patients who only have a few more days of the drug and the question then comes up, how are we going to take care of this? Um, uh, in concert with um, uh, uh, over 20 of my colleagues around the country um, and three different patient advocacy groups, uh, we sent a letter to Dr. Pazder and the FDA requesting that patients receive um, at least one more supply of panatinib before we need to go through this IND process to obtain the drug. Again, with very serious safety concerns, the FDA has decided at this point um, that they do not want to go that route, but really do believe that the single patient IND process will be the most expeditious way for patients who are tolerating and benefiting from panatinib to remain on the drug. The FDA 
and Ariad Pharmaceuticals have been working together in, in concert over the last few days to come up with a plan to make sure that this IND process goes smoothly. Um, and this information is going to be distributed um, to um, your physicians um, over the next uh, uh, day or two. Um, I have seen, seen the plan. I have already begun to apply for an IND, and I can tell you that the FDA has been um, very uh, res responsive to the initial request for an IND. We need to keep, uh, keep this, moving this forward, though. We need to make sure that um, the FDA and Ariad physicians and their patients work closely together to ensure that um, if they are benefiting from panatinib and tolerating the drug, that they are able to remain on this medication. And so we're very hopeful that this process that has been set out by the FDA will allow our patients to continue on uh, panatinib, um, especially while we're gathering more information about the true safety uh, concerns and maybe also, very importantly, how patients may continue on panatinib, and, but we may reduce in some way the risks associated with the medication in terms of these cardiovascular and arterial occlusive events. So a lot more needs to come, but at this point, after um, discussing this problem with my colleagues and, with, um, uh, and receiving feedback from the FDA, uh, I've been reassured that there is a real effort to make sure that people will continue to have access to panatinib. The FDA, Ariad, your physicians, understand very well how important this medication is to your um, ongoing health and response and will work closely together to make sure that the, your supply of the drug is not interrupted. Thank you.